But before I continue, my request that my co-compare please join me. Uh, she is the Managing Director, CEO of the Financial uh, Institute, sorry, Training Center, uh, Mrs. Chiazo Malize. Mrs. Chiazo, please. Shall we start by standing up for the national anthem? Let us pray. Loving and gracious Father, we thank you for this day which you have made, and we rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you for the country you have created for us, and the resources you have endowed us with in this country. And we also thank you for the continent of Africa that you have blessed tremendously. Lord, we give glory to your name. Today we are gathered to look at the problems of our continent, the problems of our country, which in spite of the endowment have continued to be in poverty and be constrained by insecurity and lack of economic development. Gracious Father, we pray that you will bless us with your presence today. We pray especially for your daughter, Judea who has been putting this together in memory of her dear husband. Father, we thank you for what her husband stood for, what he did during his lifetime. And we thank you that his legacy lives on. And we pray, Lord, that you continue to bless your daughter you continue to guide her. And the board of trustees that have been helping her and lifting her up, may you bless each and every one of them. We commit the speaker of today to you. Thank you for bringing him down safely. Thank you for what you have used him to do in his country and in the continent. Father, as he speaks to us today, may you give us ears to listen, hearts to take what he is sharing with us and the grace and the courage to move and utilize them. We commit the chairman to you. We commit other members of the board of trustees to you. And we commit all of us who are gathered here. You have placed us in various positions of responsibilities in this country, even beyond this country. Father, give us the grace to show the light. Thank you, gracious Father. As we gather here, 
we remember our president. We remember the leaders of this country. Father, you have placed them in positions of authority. It is their responsibility to ensure security and to ensure that there is economic development and that there is inclusiveness and everybody in this country feels part of this nation. Father, open their ears. Let them hear the cry of the people. Let them see what lies ahead of us, the dangers ahead of us, and give them the grace to work in such a way that all of us will be part of the ship. Thank you, gracious Father. Thank you, our King of Kings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm almost sure you're tired of standing. Shall we please stand up again? Shall we please stand up again in memory of this great architect whose foundation was founded by the wife? Shall we observe two minutes of silence for architect Gordon Jidimba? May his soul rest in perfect peace. Thank you. Is that it? Good morning, distinguished people. Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome you to today's event. This is something that happens all the time by a visionary woman who thought to extend the legacy of a great man. And it's so, with so much joy, we, act, we acknowledge the presence of all of the dignitaries here present, and we stand on all protocols in view of the limited time we have. On behalf of the Foundation, I'd like to recognize the dignitaries that are here with us, up here on the table. Everybody's distinguished, but we'll start on the ones who are here. We'd actually have to start with the person who is the chairperson of the Board of Trustees today, who is sitting as the chief host in collaboration with Dr. Jidema, and that's Professor Fatu Tommy. He's the chairman of the Board of Trustees for the foundation, and of course the founder and CEO of Center for Values and Leadership. We'd also like to recognize the chairperson of today, who is going to stay at the event, and she's sitting in here today as Professor Joy Ogu, OFR. She's the former Minister of Foreign Affairs, Federal Republic of Nigeria, former permanent secretary, former permanent representative of Nigeria to the United Nations, and today's chairman. Thank you. We'd also like to recognize a man of many words, wealth of experience, and extremely passionate about Africa, who is a distinguished guest lecturer today. And that's Professor P. L. O. Lumumba. Please put your hands together for him. I've heard him speak a lot of times. He is a moving encyclopedia. We'd also like to recognize today, who is also on the high table, our Dr. Mrs. Nike Akonde, C-O-N. She's a former Minister of Industry for the Federal Republic of Nigeria and the Chairman, NEPAD Business Group, Nigeria. We'd also like to recognize another legal luminary, and that is uh, Justice Rosalind Ukeje. Please put your hands together for her for all the great things she's done at the bench, for all the learnings she's shared, and all of the things that she's done greatly for our nation. I would also like to, we do know her already, but she is also extremely distinguished for her vision, Dr. Jidema. Please put your hands together for her. At this time, ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to invite the chairperson, the chairman of the occasion, to deliver her opening remarks. And so, Professor Joy Ugu, OFR, we give you the podium. Good morning, everyone and um, distinguished speaker, we are glad to see you in person rather than on the YouTube. 
My sisters at the table, I'm glad to see you again. My brother Pat, I'm glad to see you again. And Dr. Jidema, I want to thank you for inviting me and for bringing me back to this environment, this homecoming for me. On the platform of this institution, the world heard my voice, and it gave me an opportunity to blossom. Just remember that that's what to be said for strong institutions in any polity. When institutions are strong, nations are strong, because there are continuities rather than discontinuities. So the Institute of International Affairs stands as one of those strong institutions committed to research and teaching and the training of diplomats in international relations. But that's by the way. Uh, we, we have come here for a purpose and each and every one of us here, I assume, is committed to the cause for which our dear sister uh, has stood. For me, EJ is uh, the quintessential virtuous woman found in Proverbs 31, I think. For a woman to be so passionate and committed to the memory of her spouse at this level is something phenomenal, very phenomenal. I've been a widow for five years, but I can't imagine the level of her commitment. But it takes two. Her husband stood for values, principles, ideas. And that's what endures in any system. Not the ephemeral things, but the values, the principles. Because you build on them as a scaffold. But in most African societies, we don't build scaffolds. We erase the blackboard. And we want to start all over again. We keep starting over and over again. So, and then for architect Jidema himself, he had values. He imbibed principles. He cherished them. He pursued them passionately and relentlessly. He cultivated enduring values. And his desire was to hand over to succeeding generations what he knows about. And his wife continues with that legacy. EJ, I, I want to say that you offer us lessons of life. You offer us lessons of passion and lessons of love. And we thank you. You know, in our society, we often long for heroes that there are very few heroes. So let's cherish the ones we have. The fact that you are all here means you have a commitment to the ideas and the principles for which this man lived. And this relates to philosophy as the foundation of any society. I'm not saying that we don't have philosophers. Professor Lumumba knows we do. There are African philosophers, but we practice alien political systems established by their own philosophers. Going through school for so many years, we studied philosophy. One remarkable one that talked about democracy is the French philosopher Montesquieu. He came over during the French, uh, the American Revolution to help them in establishing their society. And I chose him because he's the one who talked about virtue. He said, virtue is the crucial necessity for the survival of a free people. Virtue is the crucial necessity for the survival of a free people. The Bible even says it with greater vehemence. It says, Righteousness exalts a nation. 
that's the equivalent of that philosophy. Can we ask ourselves in African societies how righteousness exalts us? Can we ask ourselves in the current system of democracies that we practice, how we have evolved virtues and values in order to govern? And this social contract between the governed and the ruler seems a bit hazy. As individuals, as citizens, we must understand our responsibilities. African leaders want to be leaders without, first of all, being good citizens. And these are areas I think we must look into. We are here to listen to the man I describe as the voice of Africa. His courage is admirable and remarkable. All you have to do is tune into YouTube and you find him there. <coughs> he has become Africa's greatest voice and a profoundly inspiring human being. We've come to listen to him, not to me. But this scenario that we have today reminds me of one, one of my very favorite thinkers, Archbishop Fulton Shin. He was ordained a priest a hundred years ago. But again, his principles, his values, live after him. I want to share with you what he said about the message, because we are we're going to listen to the message from Professor Lumumba. He said, three elements conspire in the making of every great message. Three elements conspire in the making of every great message. First is the pulpit. Second is the audience. And third is the truth. Professor Lumumba is going to tell us the truth today. And that's why I believe that these three elements are present here today. Thank you. That's from the quintessential African diplomat and our erudite political scientist. If nothing is remarkable from all of the wonderful speech, it is the fact that it was like homecoming for Dr. Joy, who has worked in this organization, Nigeria Institute of International Affairs, like we all know, in the past as a director general. Of course, yes, please. I'm sure that the gentility of that delivery is also a reflection of her work as a foreign affairs minister for Nigeria and of course her role in the United Nations in New York. I'm sure that all of that reflected in this gentle delivery. Please put your hands together for her one more time. I'd also at this point in time like to call on the chairperson, chairman of this foundation for his own brief remarks. I'm calling on Professor Patutomi to give us a brief remark this morning. Chairperson of the occasion, a very distinguished speaker, very distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I am truly privileged to be able to say welcome because that's really all that I will do. Welcome to Professor Joy Yogu, an extraordinary woman who speaks so gently with so much power. To Professor Pierlo Lumumba, who speaks forcefully and shakes the room. <laughs> but why are we here? We are here because of a man. A man who was a friend of mine. And we all simply called him Godi. Uh, one of the things that I 
enjoy about reflecting from time to time uh, his memory is the fact that he was concerned about an enduring issue in human engagement, which is why do men cooperate? Why do men cooperate in a way that leads to the advance of the common good of all? And very often, we hear as Africans that our binding philosophy is Ubuntu. I am because we are. Sometimes I wonder if we really live our Africanness. I'm glad that today we'll be able to engage on that subject through the prism to the world of a man who has uh, managed to inspire plenty in many of us as Africans. But I want to urge just one thing. As we listen, please, let's not just be like the typical Nigerian audience that enjoys a good speech. If we could make a commitment to doing something. Because change will only come from each and every one of us doing something about the space around us. This is a country that keeps waiting for a Messiah. The Messiah has come already. And the Messiah has empowered us to make it happen ourselves. Thank you for coming, and let's have a wonderful, wonderful day. God bless you. Thank you so much, Prof, for that wonderful one. And I would also like to invite for the welcome address the woman whom we've described in different ways today. And that's Dr. E.J. Jidema, who is the Executive Secretary of Godi Jidema Foundation. She's the founder and Executive Secretary of the Godi Jidema Foundation. She's the Chief Executive Officer of Leading Edge Consulting. She's the Managing Partner of IROC Global Executive Search Partnership. Please put your hands together. Those are quite a whole lot. And I'm not done yet. She is also the Vice President of the International, of the Institute of Directors. Please put your hands together for her as she stands for her welcome address. Stand on the existing protocol. I welcome you all gathered here, leaders of thought, captains of industries, friends, and distinguished ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed a great delight to welcome all of you, dear friends, to the sixth biannual public lecture of the Godi Jidema Foundation. This is a journey which we embarked on with you 10 years ago when the first public lecture was battered. You have all remained steadfast and honestly, I'm humbled by your support. We, as the Board of Trustees, are also humbled by the magnitude of the response which you have shown, showing that Nigerians are actually hungry for knowledge they are coming to listen to Professor Lumumba here. They are hungry for solution of 
to the problems which we have as which have assailed them for a long time. But I dare say that the solution resides in all. And um, it's for all of us to contribute whatever quota we can in making the difference. Now, there are so many things that we've been talking about. We've been talking about impoverishment of the populace. We've been talking about death in terms of infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. Even more urgent is the solution to insecurity. Insecurity is what has crept on us like a thief and has refused to go away. Kidnapping is now an everyday phenomenon. What can be done about this? Is our country a failing state? What are the developmental indices we would like to see? The Gordi Didema Foundation is now 12 years old. It was established in 2007, I missed years. But we have since moved on to see that we do those things which Akita Gordi Didema would have done. We are here to be alive today. We have continued with the prizes of excellence, which we have instituted in schools across the country. Colleges like Loyola Jesuit College, Bech Freeman, Secondary School Lagos, Bacheli School of the Blind, Nam Zikiwe, Secondary School Abagana, and Ezike High School, Nibo. We are also doing our groundwork on Igbo Gadi, which is actually reorientation of the Igbo youth in, uh, so that in terms of self-concept in relation to what they passed through the Nigerian Civil War. All these awards we have instituted are not just about award or even the, the money or the token that we give to the valedictorian in the case of public speaking or even the best student in case of excellence award. It is just about serving as catalysts facilitators in terms of the mindset, the mindset shift, so that our youth would place value in things that matter. That is what it's about. It is about nurturing the leaders with the right values, such as diligence and meritocracy. We have variously carried out philanthropy or charity uh, in aid of disadvantaged people as well. And these are things we do from time to time collaborating with other NGOs as well. Our thought leadership series remains our flagship in terms of the caliber of decision makers that it attracts. This cuts across high-ranking Nigerians, business leaders, leaders of thought, academia, captains of industry, and everyday men and women. Our last lecture was delivered by Professor Kinsley Morialo, a former governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria whom I can rightly refer to as a change maker. He took on the challenge to change the society for better by contesting for the presidential ticket. We would not give up. Africa cannot afford to give up. There are already some shining stars that can be identified even within our continent. There are talks about Rwanda, Ethiopia, etc., which have recorded remarkable growth. This gives us some comfort, but it also challenges us as Nigerians as the sleeping giant to arise from our slumber and not drag Africa down. We must find a place to stand to move the world. We owe it to the black race. Our humanity cannot be compromised. We had been there before. In ancient Egypt, the Songhai Empire, the great university of Timbuktu, the re-civilization, the Oyo Empire, the Kanembornu, Etc. We must continue to seek so that we can find where the rain started beating us. We must continue to knock so that the door of development can be opened. More importantly, we must be original in our thinking and believe in ourselves as a people, endowed by God Almighty with the same gifts that are obtainable elsewhere, if not more. Once more, we thank our distinguished lecturer, Professor Lumumba, for coming all the way. And all those that have visited from far and wide, I know he had some friends coming in from Liberia, some from other parts of the world, California, etc., etc. 
We thank you all for coming here. And um, we also want to um, thank our diamond sponsor, Emzo Pharmaceutical, for partnering with us and all other partners who have supported us in various ways. We welcome you all. Thank you very much for listening. Shall we please give another round of applause? Well, we're just about getting to the, um, the matter this morning. We, we started at 20 minutes past 11, so we're doing well on time. Um, the chairman has taken permission to leave. He's actually on his way to Nairobi uh, to negotiate another rail contract. Uh, but uh, before the speeches come, I think we'll get, get somebody to be reacting Deputy Vice Assistant Chairman for the occasion. Um, we are at the occasion of uh, trying to introduce this great man whose uh, decibels of voice rises proportionately to his height, Professor Lubumba, but it's not my responsibility to introduce him. Uh, I've been asked to ask a gentle lady who is here with us, who works for one of the largest consumer services company in the world. I think they have an audience of over one billion people. She happens to be the business development manager for Nigeria, but more important, uh, she's the daughter of architect Godi Jidema. She's the business development manager for Facebook, Africa, West Africa, the world. Uh, please put your hands together for Ms. Nachi Jidema. She's here to read the citation. So. Thank you very much. Good morning, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. It is my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce Professor P.L. Lumumba today. As we all know, Professor P.L. Lumumba is a renowned Pan-Africanist, public intellectual, and legal practitioner in Africa. He is the immediate former director and chief executive officer of the Kenya School of Law, a former secretary of the Constitution of Kenya Review Commission, and a former director of the defunct Kenya Anti-Corruption Commission. He is the founding trustee of the African Institute for Leaders and Leadership and founding chairman of the Association of the Citizens Against Corruption. He was the founding Kabarak University School of Law, a former lecturer at the University of Nairobi, the United States International University, and Widener University USA. Professor Lumumba is an associate professor of public law a holder of a Doctor of Laws and the Law of the Sea from the University of Ghent, Belgium, and a holder of a Master's of Laws degree and Bachelor of Laws degree from the University of Nairobi. Professor Lumumba holds an honorary degree of Doctors of Letters from the University of Cape Coast in Ghana. He is also a holder of the Doctor of Science degree from Bell's University of Technology in Nigeria. He is an advocate of the High Courts of Kenya and Tanganyika. He is a Fellow of the Institute of Certified Public Secretaries of Kenya, a Fellow of the Kenya Institute of Management, and an Honorary Fellow of the African Academy of Sciences. He is the Chairman of Farafina Investment Group in Monrovia, Liberia, and the Economic Strategic Growth and Development Initiative for Africa based in Nigeria. He has written several books, including Criminal Procedure in Kenya, An Outline of Judicial Review. 
He has published numerous articles in re ref referee journals and several book chapters. He was the recipient of the 2008 Martin Luther King Africa Salute to Greatness Award by the Martin Luther King Jr. Africa Foundation. In 2012, the East African Association of Anti-Corruption Authorities recognized him for his valuable and exemplary contribution in the fight against corruption. He was the distinguished Mualimu Julius Nyerere lecturer at the University of Dar es Salaam in 2014. He was the 11th Kwame Nkrumah lecturer at the University of Cape Coast, Ghana in 2016. He was the Nelson Mandela Centenary Memorial Lecturer at Walter Sisulu University in South Africa in 2008, 2018. He has been named and recognized by the International Commission of Jurists and the Law Society of Kenya for his exemplary contribution to the legal profession. He was awarded a Lifetime Achievement for Patriotism and Advocacy by the African Forum in 2017 and he was recognized by the New African Magazine as one of the hundred most influential Africans in the world today. He currently practices law with Lumumba and Lumumba Advocates and coordinates activities under the ages of the PLO Lumumba Foundation. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Please join me in welcoming Professor PLO Lumumba. Good afternoon. Let me do what is now Nigerian to stand by the protocols already established. I think it is a very good thing because it allows you not to annoy anybody if you get the protocols wrong. But let me say how glad I am to have been invited to be the sixth Godi Jidanma lecturer here in Lagos, Nigeria. It is not lost on me that I come after a group of illustrious men. The first lecturer was a man whose books I read at the university, Professor Buen Nwabweze. He was followed immediately by a man that I admire and read every so often, my fellow countryman Ali Mazurui. And it did not stop there. He was followed by yet another great thinker, Jonah Elaegu, and followed immediately by a man I met yesterday, Professor Pat Itomi, and lastly by Kingsley Mohalu. I am the least of all of them, but the Igbo of a saying that a child who has washed his hands with eat with kings, I am such a one as that. So there is a sense in which it gives me great joy to be given the honor and privilege of sharing my thoughts with you on a subject that is evergreen, the subject of governance, insecurity, and economic development in our beloved African continent. There are those who now say that the problems of Africa have been overanalyzed and that therefore time for action is now. To such as those, I remind them that the Africa we are talking about is Africa in the post-colonial era, and the oldest of those countries is Ghana, which only attained independence 60 years ago. Not that I'm discounting Liberia, which again regained our independence in 1847. But I'm alive to the fact that the bulk of the African countries that we talk about today and that we mention every so often were colonial constructs. 
It is for that reason, therefore, that a conversation of this nature must necessarily begin by looking at the history of the modern African state. And I'm using the word modern very guardedly and instructively to talk about the nation that was created by the colonizing powers. Africa is today divided into 54 officially recognized states. I'm aware that the people of Saharawi make a claim to their statehood but they are not recognized. I'm equally aware that the Ambazonians make a claim to their nationhood, but they are not recognized. But let us ask ourselves how these nations came into being. These nations came into being, and we all know, courtesy of history, when the European powers settled in Berlin in 1884, and when they assembled there, uh, their main reason was to ensure that they exploited Africa in a coordinated way. And the way was coordinated in a manner that ensured that if the British had their spheres of influence, they did not interfere with the French. And if the French did, had their spheres of influence, they did not interfere with the Germans. And the Germans did not interfere with the Portuguese, and the Portuguese did not interfere with the Spaniards. That is how we had our countries puzzled in the manner that we have them today. So pernicious was the entire process of the partition of Africa that sometimes it saddens me that the Africans don't talk about reparation as loudly and as passionately as they should. But voices are beginning to emerge, and one assumes and hopes that they will be coordinated in order to give prominence to the sense of guilt that the European powers ought to have when they are dealing with Africa. It is that Africa that we are talking about. But the Africans were not colonized without resistance. Africans were resisting in the West, they were resisting in the South, they were resisting in the East, they were resisting in the North. And after the World War II, which I normally refer to as the tribal war of the Europeans, after the Europeans had slaughtered themselves in 1945, and the colonial project was no longer viable, they started listening to voices of reason. And the United Nations, which we know was created in 1945, in the absence of all African countries in San Francisco in the United States, came up with a resolution for the freedom of colonized peoples in 1960. But that is not the time when African countries had started agitating for independence. A casual reading of history, whether it is the history of what we now call Nigeria or what we now call Mali or what we call Kenya or Uganda or Tanzania, will inform us that the struggle had started in earnest much earlier. But it is Ghana that blazed the trail. In the month of March 1957, Ghana regained her independence. And there is a sense in which when we use these foreign languages, and English is such a language as such, we must use words correctly. We did not gain our independence, we regained our independence. When we regained our independence, we promised each other, and indeed the people who supported our founding fathers were clear that the reason why we were expelling the colonizers is because we recognize that our dignity could only be restored if we regained our independence. And if you look at even the informal works of the great thinkers of the day, whether it was Namdi Azikiwe here in Nigeria, or Obafemi Awolowo, or Tafawa Balewa, or even a uh, Sardana of Sokoto, Sahmadu Bello, whether you disagreed with him, there was that recognition. 
If you went to Mali and you listened to Modibo Keita, you recognized the clarity and the passion with which he spoke. And if you went to East Africa and listened to Julius Nyerere or even Jomo Kenyatta at that time or Kaunda at that time, there was a sense in which there was unanimity that Africa could only realize her potential if she regained her independence. So it was joy and celebration in Accra, Ghana, on the 6th day of March, 1957. But Kwame Nkrumah, whom we sometimes refer to ad nauseum, was the clearest of all leaders in terms of thinking and articulation of what Africa needed. While the Ghanaians were celebrating on that day, he reminded them that the freedom of Ghana did not mark the end. Indeed, he told them that the freedom of Ghana meant nothing if the rest of Africa was not free. He reminded his audience that indeed they must remember that the only reason why the people of Ghana entrusted them with leadership is because they believed that they would do better than the colonizers and that if they reneged on that promise, the same forces that were marshaled to remove the colonizers would be marshaled to remove them. That was the message of Kwame Nukuruma. So that the Africa that we inherited was an Africa that had promises, and those promises were loud and clear. If you listen to the leaders of the day, whether it was David Dako speaking in Central African Republic, he was saying that we are freeing ourselves from the French because we think we can do better. Whether it was Ahmed Sekotoure speaking in Guinea, he was saying we can do better because we are now free. Whether it was Amilka Cabral speaking in Guinea-Bissau, the message was one and clear. But the question is, history having been analyzed and understood, is Africa the better today? Is Africa punching at our way? Is Africa realizing our potential? Have the promises of independence been achieved, whether you look at North or South or Central or West? or Southern Africa, or the leaders reneged on their promise. I remember so very vividly when in the month of May, on the 24th and 25th days of May to be exact, the leaders of Africa assembled in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, each one of them convicted, each one of them resolute, each one of them clear, and saying with one voice and unanimity that Africa had to be united. And what stood out on that day was that everybody, even the ones who turned out to be monsters a little later, were clear. And some of the speeches that stood out on that day were those of David Dako of Central African Republic. And I choose David Dako because subsequently he did not perform very well. But he said, our country is so small that if we do not walk with fellow Africans as a united front, we will be recolonized again. The other voice was that of Modibo Keita from Mali. The other one was that of Julius Kambarage Nyerere. He reminded his audience on that day, we have come here not to remind ourselves how important unity is. We know that it is important to be united. But the most eloquent and the most passionate and the most urgent voice of the day was that of Ghana's Kwame Nkrumah. He told the audience, we Africans must come out of this place united with one country, with one army. We must come out here with one currency. We must leave this place as the United States of Africa because if we don't, the neo-colonial project will torpedo all the things that we have worked for. But they listen to him not. They listen to him not 
because they took the view that the growth of African unity must be gradual, they listened to him not. And therefore we came out with a body called the Organization of African Unity, whom commentators then described as a bulldog without teeth. But sometimes I ask myself, what, was it ever a dog at all? <laughs> but we heard it nevertheless. And therefore, over the years, we started recognizing that Kwame Nukuruma was right. We started recognizing that he was right because the neo-colonial powers were always alive and well. In 1960, no sooner had Togo settled in our independence, then they took away Silvanus Olympio. The French activities were not that subterranean. They were overt, and we could see them. The Belgians were not overt. Barely nine months after they had regained their independence, the Congolese had lost the man for whom I am named, Patrice Emery Lumumba. And soon thereafter, we had coup d'etats. If there was no coup in Mali, there was a coup in Nigeria. If there was no coup in Nigeria, there was one in Togo. If there was no coup in Togo, there was one in Dahomey. If there was none in Dahomey, there was one in Liberia. If there was none in Liberia, there was another one in the Gambia. And if there was none in the Gambia, there was one in Uganda. And if there was none in Uganda, there was one in Rwanda. And if there was none in Rwanda, there was one in Burundi. And if there was none in Burundi, there was one in Somalia. So that Africa became the home of coup d'etats. And one wonders who was engineering those coup d'etats. There are those who say that Africans are in the business of blaming their former colonizers. But the truth is that they must be blamed because they continue to be alive and well. They continue to be alive and well in surreptitious ways. You know, I often ask myself what was the significance when the British left us they created something called the Commonwealth. Some will say that it has, it has been useful. But why is it, if it is a community of independent nations, why is the chair and the president and the head of the Commonwealth perpetually the monarch of England? Why not Nigerian president? Why not Ugandan president? No, the Commonwealth is a body that is created to give the British a sense of perpetual ownership for their lost kingdoms. And the reason why we must recognize that, why is the United States not a member of it? And it was a former colony of the British. The French have their own, where they bring together all the former French colonies and is headquartered in Paris. And the, to the French, it doesn't stop there. They even control their currency, and they don't stop there. They even have their armies in the countries that they control, and they don't stop there. They even tell you who to elect, and they don't even stop there. They tell you where to invest, and they don't even stop there. They want to tell you what to do, and they don't even stop there. They come and exploit your resources, and they don't even stop there. They want to tell you how to run your laws, and they don't even stop there. They tell you who to send to jail and who not to send to jail. The colonial project is alive and well. And if it is not alive and well in France, you go to, to Portugal and you ask the Angolans who control the affairs. Even weak Portugal still controls our countries. If they don't control Portugal, they can't control Guinea-Bissau. And if they don't control Guinea-Bissau, they control Mozambique. And if they don't control Mozambique, they control Sao Tome and Principe. And if they don't control that, they control Cape Verde. Africa is still a continent that is controlled by others. Which reminds me, one of our problems as Africans, and I remember Samora Moises Marshall of Mozambique talking about it in 1982, that sometimes he's amazed by Africans. When Africans sit and compare the colonizers, those who are colonized by the British say, our colonizers were better than yours. And the, those who are colonized by the French say that your colonizers were better than ours. 
And he said, how can slaves sit and say that one slave master was better than the other? Slavery is evil and colonization is evil. Why is this necessary? Some may wonder. Why must we rehash all these? Because it explains some of the problems that we still have here in the continent of Africa. Which brings me to the subject of insecurity. You know, only yesterday I had a visit from Professor Utom at night, not like Nicodemus at night. <laughs> but he visited me, and during our conversation, we got talking about insecurity in Africa, and we agonized, and he came out with something that I was thought was inspired, and this is what he said that sometimes Africa and the African continent is so deep in water that even a ripple will make Africa drown. And that therefore, going forward, we must ask ourselves, what must we do in order not to drown? And I told him, do you know that the Organization of African Unity has declared that the year 2020 will be the year when the guns will be silent in Africa. And I went further and I told him that we must never confuse silence for peace. Africa may be silent, but Africa is not peaceful. And I want us to look at Africa today and have a look at the map of Africa and tell me, is Africa at peace? Is Africa at peace? When blacks in South Africa tell their brethren in Nigeria to go back home, but they don't say the same to the Chinese, is Africa at peace? Is Africa at peace when Zimbabwe is restless? Is Africa at peace when the rebels are still active in Mozambique, is Africa at peace? When Somalia is not at rest, is Africa at peace when the results of the election in Malawi have not been settled today? Is Africa at peace? Is Africa at peace when Eritrea still grapples with her internal problem? Is Africa at peace when South Sudan still have to be visit the Roman Catholic Pope to kiss the feet of their leaders? to persuade them to have rapprochement is Africa at peace when Sudan does not have peace and calm, when Darfur is still under African Union forces, is Africa at peace when Burkina Faso still have to call in the French army, is Africa at peace when Mauritania and Mali still have the French to intervene, is Africa at peace when the Casamans in Senegal still calls for their independence. Is Africa at peace when Togo is not at peace, when Guinea Conakry is not at peace? Is Africa at peace when kidnapping becomes the occupation of some young men in Nigeria? Is Africa at peace? Africa is not at peace. And the question is, what is the result and what is the reason of this insecurity that undermines our very being as a people and undermines socio-economic development. The reason is that when Africa is not at peace, then there are those who benefit from it. If you look at many countries in the world, even the ones that you think are innocent, if you look at some of their largest exports to Africa, it is weapons. If it is not landmines, it is bullets. If it is not bullets, it is other weapons that they bring to the continent of Africa. They create war that they may be peacemakers. And when they've made the peace through the war that they created, then they are nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. This is the Africa that we are talking about, an Africa that is normally defined from outsiders. 
It is on Africa that it is always looked at and spoken about either in past tense or in future tense. Africa used to be great. Africa will be great. They never say Africa is great. I look forward to the day when the past tense and the future tense will not be used in reference to our continent. I look forward to the day when we shall say of Africa, you are great and great now. But as I speak now, insecurity abounds in the continent and each one of our countries is never too far. Many African countries are between the intensive care unit and the graveyard. It is our duty to ensure that we do not allow them to slip to the other side. The net effect of African insecurity is that it brings about poverty. And poverty is one of the biggest industries in the world. You know, I think about Africa very often, and I read about Africa very often, and I know that there are many Africans and non-Africans who have written about Africa. And one can think about many who have written about the continent of Africa and it's good to take advantage of the history that we have had about the continent of Africa. Only in the last one month I've been rereading the works of a man called Martin Meredith. And he talks about the state of Africa and analyzes it so very well how she is rich but paradoxically her sons and daughters are the poorest on earth. I read Martin Meredith again when he talks about the fortunes of Africa and he says that how this continent was so rich that at one time when a man called Mansa Musa left Mali on a pilgrimage to Mecca he had so much gold that the world did not recover from his riches for several decades. When he says that Mansa Musa was possibly the richest man that the world has ever seen, he talks about the riches of Africa. Yet paradoxically and ironically, Africa is the poorest continent on earth. I read about Africa and I know that the Democratic Republic of Congo is the richest resource country on earth that every mobile phone that we have has an ingredient which is only found in the Democratic Republic of Congo, Colton, or Riyadh. And it is not lost on me that no African country manufactures a mobile phone until very recently when Rwanda and South Africa started assembling mobile phones. No African country manufactures a mobile phone. And I do not stop there. I know that Africa has some of the most medically beneficial plants in Africa and I still know that in order to cure our own we've got to import medicine that is made by Novartis or Bayer and I still know that when our leaders are sick unless they are suicidal they'll never attend a hospital in Africa they go to Europe and America and yet Africa is rich but nothing happens I know that we have some of the best possible sources of electricity. It is estimated that the Grand Inga Dam in the Democratic Republic of Congo can generate enough power for the continent of Africa. And I still know that Belgium perhaps has more light and more electricity and generates more energy than the entire continent of Africa, excluding Algeria and South Africa. And I also know that Tehran, Iran produces more power than all sub-Saharan countries combined. I know all that. Africa is rich, yet she is poor. I know that Africa is a market. We produce oil, but as Ali Mazrui rightly said, Africa produces what she does not consume and consumes what she does not produce. I do know that Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana produce chocolate but the best chocolate that we buy is from Switzerland and Belgium who do not know what a cocoa leaf looks like. I do know that Ghana and Nigeria produces bitter leaf, 
but bitter leaf is now patented in the United States of America. That is Africa for us. What and who manufactures this poverty? Are we co-authors of our own misfortune? Have we lamented for too long? Has time come that Africa must stop lamenting? Lament we must, but we must not end at lamentation. Greg Mills, a South African thinker, argues, and I agree with him partially, that African countries are poor because their leaders have chosen that path. But I also want to add that even the population have urged them on because in many African countries, when we are given the opportunity to elect men and women into public office, we elect men and women whose claim to fame is that they want to undermine everything that we desire. We are given opportunity to elect and to run our politics in ways that are not understood by us. So Greg Mills is right. It is leaders who make a choice that their countries must be poor. But that is only a part of the story. The other part of the story is that the neo-colonizers persuaded us very early on that we can only thrive when we are given aid. And for a long time, Africa was given aid, but was it really aid, the things that we are receiving from the European Union, receiving from France, receiving from the United Kingdom, receiving from Germany, was it aid? No, no it was not. It was their way of atoning for their sins, but they never say it. <laughs> Indeed, the truth is, that the thing that they call aid can never, ever satisfy and solve our problems. Once again, the young Zambian girl, Dambi Samoyo, in her little book, Dead Aid, says, you cannot expect to liberate yourself from poverty by receiving aid. But why is it that Europe is always in the business of creating structures where we are granted aid? How many of you here will forget the Lomé Convention of 1975? You'll remember when the European powers met in Lomé, Togo, and they came up with the African, Caribbean, and Pacific, and they told us that our path to growth was through aid that was administered by them, and we believed them. When Lomé was dead, they met again in 2000 in Cotonou in Benin, and they came up with yet another arrangement. And when that stopped, they came up with the structural adjustment system in the 1980s. Africa is always a laboratory for the ideas of young men and women who are working toward their PhDs in Yale, in Harvard, and in Cambridge, and in Oxford. They are doing all these while the University of Lagos is not doing anything while the University of Dar es Salaam is doing nothing, while Makere is doing nothing, the time has come that we must ask ourselves, what can we do to fight poverty, which has served to dehumanize us? And they do not stop there. Whenever we think we want to do our own thing, they are quick to come with their own things. They came with something called Nepad. And there is a man whom I do not like, but this idea from him I liked. Yaya Jame of Gambia. He said when they talk about Nepad, what it really means is that they are Nepads, that we wear upon our knees and kneel before them as we beg. And there is a sense that if you want to ask yourself what is the product and what are the dividends of Nepad, is Africa the richer because there was Nepad? If Africa has progress, it was in spite of Nepad, not because of it. But Africa has never tired. I remember in 1980 here in Lagos, Nigeria, Africans having recognized their problems will not be solved by others, came up with the Lagos Plan of Action. 
And the Lagos plan of action recognized that if we want to trade with ourselves, we must work together. But the Lagos plan of action was dead on arrival. Africa still does not trade with herself. So that today, here in Nigeria, you love rice, but you do not produce enough rice. You go to Ghana, they love rice, but they import one billion worth of rice from the Asians. Africa produces what she does not consume and consumes what she does not produce. Africa is the home of NGOs. Some call them nothing going on. <laughs> and there is a sense in which nothing goes on. There is much motion without light. If NGOs were to solve Africa's problem, Africa would be in the first world. For which country in Africa does not have NGOs dealing with water? Which country in Africa does not have NGOs dealing with poverty? Which, NGO, which country in Africa does not have NGOs dealing with farming? Which country in Africa does not have NGOs in all sectors? Why is it that despite all these, Africa is still where she ought not to be? We have been lulled into a false sense of security. Writing in 1983, Chinua Achebe, in his little book, The Trouble with Nigeria, said, that many Africans suffer from what he described as the cargo cult mentality. He said, not me, Chinua Achebe, the belief by backward people that without any effort on their part, the thing that they have always wanted will arrive at their port of hope without any action on their part. The belief that you can get things that are under the bed without bending. The belief that you can use the magician's pronouncement of abracadabra and lo and behold things come without effort. The belief that you can get things that require effort without effort on your part. Chinua Achebe summarized and said the problem he said of Nigeria at that time is that the problem of Nigeria is simply and squarely a problem of leadership. And which is true not only of Nigeria but true of most of Africa. We are poor. But yet also, we must interrogate this thing called poverty. We have been told that the only measure of success is something called the GDP. And that this GDP is further divided into per capita income. When you go into many African countries, you'll find that one person can have the per capita income of one million people. Is the GDP indeed a correct index of measuring how successful we are doing? Or we must now go to the way of the Bhutanese and have another index called the, Grace, the, the Gross National Happiness Index. But let us not confuse excitement with happiness. Sometimes people are merely excited, but are they happy and what will make them happy? All human beings want to have the quality of their lives to improve. Today, when we talk about poverty, we are asking ourselves, can Africans have food on their table? When we talk about poverty, can we have and ensure that Africans have potable waters when they are thirsty? When we talk about poverty, we are asking ourselves whether our young men and women can get opportunities. We are asking ourselves whether Africa can feed ourselves. We are asking ourselves whether Nigeria is capable of supplying sufficient food for our people, whether the Democratic Republic of Congo can do so. I remember so very sadly when there was the mad cow disease in the United Kingdom and one of the most insensitive members of parliament in the United Kingdom said, all these meat that we are throwing here in England because of the mad cow, take them to Africa, let them eat even if they are dying, they were dying anyway. 
That is how Africa looks at the world. That is how the world looks at Africa. Have we brought it upon ourselves that the world looks at us in that way? Which brings me to the question, when we talk about economic development, is that the route that we will now use to liberate the continent of Africa from the chains of sorrows and lamentation. But even before I talk about that, I want to talk about the thing that is called governance. What is governance? Because governance is at the very heart of how we conduct our affairs. Today, Many African countries have been made to believe that there is something called democracy. And listen to my choice of word, something called democracy. Who defines that democracy for Africa? Paris does so. London does so. Brussels does so. Washington does so, the conceptual West does so. After the many coups that took place in Africa in the 1990s, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, we were told that the only thing that will liberate Africa from dictatorships is democracy, and this is how they define democracy. You must have many political parties, multi-party democracy. Once you have had multi-party democracy, you must have periodic elections after five years. And once you have had periodic elections, your president must have a limited term. And after they have had a limited time, you must have a free press. And after you have had a free press, you must have the civil society. And when you conduct your elections, call in observers. The observers will come from Africa, they will come from Asia, but the opinion of the Asian observers don't matter. The opinion of the African observers don't matter. The opinion of the European Union matters. When they say the elections were free and fair, then they are free and fair. And if they did not say they were free and fair, then they are not free and fair. I want us to look at Africa after the reintroduction of democracy as defined for us. Here in Nigeria, after every election cycle, whether you like it or not, the country is never at ease. In Kenya, after every election cycle, whether they are successful or not, the country is never at ease. In Uganda, the country is never at ease. In Burundi, the country is never at ease. In They never tell Kuwait that they are not democratic. They never tell Bahrain that they are never not democratic. They never tell Oman that they are not democratic. They never tell Brunei that they are not democratic. But they are so quick to tell us what to do. The net effect is that in many African countries, when there is an electoral process, 
The participants in the electoral process are sometimes mere puppets, and the puppeteers are sitting outside of Africa. And we are fighting proxy wars. I say this because our systems of governance is what will inform economic development. Let us now ask ourselves, what is this thing called economic development? But before I go to that, let us look at the international, the international architecture of governance. First of all, we agree that in 1945, when the United Nations Organization was being put together in the San Francisco in the United States of America, the many African countries that we know today were not there. It is their colonizers that were there. What is never lost on me, that after 1945 in San Francisco in the United States of America, about three years later in Paris in 1948, they came with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And the same year that they came with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that is when the apartheid regime in South Africa was being founded and European powers did not say anything about it. It is not lost on me. It is not lost on me that it is in 1945 that they came up with a structure which say that you have certain permanent members of the United Nations and that those permanent members, the vote of one of them can neutralize the votes of all African countries. It is not lost on me that when the United Nations meets, you have a meeting of all nations which we claim are all equal. But if the United States vetoes, then that is the end of the matter. If the United Kingdom vetoes, that is the end of the matter. So the one billion of us, with our 54 heads of state, we can say all we want, but little France can neutralize them with a single vote. That is the architecture of the international world. And when the G7, I do not know whether you have ever seen, and I know you have, when there is a meeting of the G7 in the recent past, they invite leaders of African countries. Nigeria and President is normally divided, invited because you are the most populous nation on Africa, and one in every five African is Nigeria, and therefore you are a big market, so they invite your President. <laughs> they also invite the chairman for the time being of African Union. And then they take a photograph. After that photograph, our leaders disappear. You never hear about them. <laughs> and yet there is another meeting of the G20. Once again, you discover that we are not there. In other words, the architecture of the international economic order does not take care of Africa, which means that we are orphans in international affairs. And if we are orphans in international affairs, it begs the question, what is it that we must do in order to immunize ourselves from the activities of our erstwhile colonizers who still control the economy of the world? Let us look at economic development today. All African countries combined last year, our GDP at the very best, was no more than two trillion United States dollars. The GDP of the state of California was three trillion dollars. The population of the state of California in the United States is slightly under 39 million. It means that the 1.2 billion of us, all the goods and services that we generate in one year is still less than the 38 million gener that generated by the 38 million citizens of the state of California. We are divided, we are so weak, and it is because of our weaknesses that we cannot do well. Look at our currency. Africa has nearly 32 currencies. Here in Nigeria, you have the Naira. In Ghana, they have the CD. When you carry your Naira to Ghana, the Ghanaian market woman will ask, what is this? When you carry your CD to Liberia, the Liberian Baba will ask, what is this? But when you carry the almighty dollar, they will quake in their boots. 
All our currencies are soft currencies because if they are hard currencies, all the others must be soft because the opposite of hard is soft. How can we compete in the world? Nigeria produces oil and exports most of it only to, re to re-import a lot of it. How can it be? How can it be that when we are exploring oil, it is Exxon model, it is Shell, it is Total, it is Elf, it is Talo that takes care of our oil? How can it be that we produce gold? And our gold is traded in London, how can it be? How can it be that we have diamond in Sierra Leone and we have diamond in Botswana and diamond in Namibia, but the price of diamond and the quality is determined in Antwerp in Belgium, how can it be? How can it be that we produce coffee in Kenya and in Ethiopia, and yet it is Nestle in Switzerland that produces Nescafe. How can it be? How can it be that we produce tea in Kenya and in Uganda, but it is the English who talk about the English tea, and not a single bush of tea grows in England? How can it be? I say all these because economic development means value addition. We can only begin to grow economically when we are talking about value addition. What value do we add? You know, in the recent past, excuse me if I'm paranoid, but paranoia is part of the solution to the African problem. <laughs> In the recent past, I've seen Africans, African heads of state being called to Japan by the Japanese prime minister to talk about the place of, Jap or the place of Africa in Japan's economic agenda. Then I've seen them called to Beijing in China. Then I've seen them called to Dubai in the Arab world. Then I've seen them being called to Sochi in Russia. Then I've seen them being called to Germany last week. What is it that people want from Africa? Why is it that Africa is so attractive? Do people love us so much that there is a competition for us? Yes, they love us so much. Because we are the, the bees that have the honey. But does the bee know how sweet the honey is? I suspect that we do not. How is it that our young men and women are running out of the continent, but if you travel to any African country today, there are young Chinese between the ages of 20 and 35 coming to Africa. There is not a single country that I know today that will not talk of a road that is built by a Chinese company. If it is not a road, it is a stadium. If it is not one such as that, then you have a Chinese restaurant which the middle class think is a sign of success. <laughs> Economic development is what I'm talking about. If I look at Africa today, the world is talking about the fourth industrial revolution. We are talking about robotics. We are talking about artificial intelligence. 
We are talking about the Internet of Things. We are talking about Facebook. We are talking about Signal. We are talking about Instagram. We are talking about cryptocurrency. We are talking about all these things, but where is my beloved Africa in the scheme of things? Where are we? Do we produce a single mobile phone? No, we don't. Do we run any internet marketing tool? We don't. Jumia was founded here in Nigeria, but by French entrepreneurs with a sprinkling of Nigerians. Half of it is now owned by MTN. So we shop from Jumia. We are told that is Africa because it has an African name. We are losing out. We lost out in the first industrial revolution. We lost out in the second industrial revolution. We lost out in the, fourth, the third industrial revolution. We are losing out in the fourth industrial revolution. So as I said at the beginning, we now humor ourselves by saying that those who built the pyramids were African. So what? It is good to humor ourselves with that history, but I'm talking about food on the table now, not the Sphinx in Giza. Africa will only realize our economic development if she begins to move in the right direction, which is what brings me to the last question of my conversation with Africa. Where is Africa going? And is she going anywhere at all? Yes, she is. You know, when I look at Africa, the colonial powers designed the post-colonial African state to fail. That was the design. That is why here in Nigeria, while the North was being administered separately with the South, on the eve of independence, they were put together in the hope that it would collapse. You have defied it. Nigeria is still alive and well, her trials and tribulations notwithstanding. They did the same in Sudan. Administered separately on the eve of independence, they put it together. Unfortunately, it did not stay for long. In the year 2001, it was split into South Sudan and Sudan. The colonial state was designed to fail. But over 50 years after independence, we have managed to weld our countries together so that we have some kind of diversity. And that is why I can still hear Kwame Nkrumah and Julius Nyerere through the vicissitudes of time say, we inherited artificial boundaries, but let us not redraw them, because if we start redrawing those boundaries, which country will not be at conflict with each other? Let us only unite, and that is how I understand where Africa is going now. In the year 2013, African states met in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, and they were celebrating 50 years after the creation of the Organization of African Unity. And I remember the chair of the OAU then was Nkosazan at Lamini Zuma. She wrote an imaginary letter to Kwame Nukuruma, telling Kwame, you are right and we were wrong. Fifty years ago, you told us to unite. We did not unite. Fifty years ago, you told us that we should trade as one united country. We did not. Fifty years ago, you told us that our safety would be guaranteed by our unity and unanimity on the things that affected the continent, but we did not. Today, 
we have recognized our mistakes and we are saying what the Catholics would say on a confession, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. And having said that, we come up with Africa Agenda 2063. Africa Agenda 2063 is a promise to you, our founding fathers. A promise that if we lost the last 50 years, we'll not lose the next 60 years. And not in so many words, but in effect, Nkosazan and Lamini Zuma was saying, in the next 50 years, by 2063, Africa will be industrialized. There'll be an equivalent of the Silicon Valley in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Africa will have anchors in the west of Africa Nigeria, the sleeping giant, will be alive and awake, and ECOWAS will not be the same again. In Southern Africa, South Africa will have shaken the vestiges of apartheid, and she will be the anchor of SADC. In East Africa, we will have Kenya and Ethiopia as anchors, and Tanzania will also make a contribution. In Central Africa, that country that is bigger than the entire Western Europe, the Democratic Republic of Congo, will no longer be a basket case of the world, but she will be the food basket of Africa. And that power will be generated from the Inga Dam. Down in Namibia, solar power will be harnessed. In the Maghreb, the Arabs will have been persuaded to determine that the Africans are not to be Africans when it is convenient and Arabs when it is inconvenient. And that therefore Africa will become a continent that we can speak of. Africa Agenda 2063, in my view, are the first baby steps which herald a realization by Africa that Africa can only unite if she speaks with one voice. There are those who are beginning to question whether Africa Agenda 2063 was dead on arrival. And before they could say, yes, indeed, Africa met in Kigali, Rwanda, and came up with the Africa Continental Free Trade Area. And I'm happy that under the Africa Continental Free Trade Area, the Secretariat is already being established in Accra, Ghana. And from the month of June next year, Africa Continental Free Trade Area will begin to operate and Africans will begin to trade with Africa. And when that begins to happen, it will no longer be necessary for the border between Nigeria and Benin to be closed at SEM. It will not be. It will no longer be necessary to close the border between Nigeria and Ghana. It will no longer be necessary to close the border between Rwanda and Uganda. It will no longer be necessary to close the border between Kenya and Tanzania. It will no longer be necessary to close the border between Zambia and Botswana. It will no longer be necessary to control the border between Lesotho and South Africa and Eswatini and South Africa. Africa will be trading as one. Well. Will these things happen in your lifetime? Perhaps not. So this is not for the faint-hearted. This is not instant coffee solution. Our duty is to do what we must and to run the relay race that, like it must be run. You run your leg well and hand over the baton to the next generation. It can be done and it will be done because if it is not done, Africa will not realize our potential. But even as I say what I am saying, Wisdom demands that I must now move to the conclusion of my conversation. And that wisdom tells me that in Africa today, there are two categories of people. There are the Afro-pessimists and there are the Afro-optimists. The Afro-pessimists are the ones, if you permit me to use this cliche, whenever the glass is half full, they will always say that the glass is half empty. The Afro-pessimists are the ones who will always say, as somebody once correctly said, for every solution they find a problem. I want to declare here and now, I am an Afro-optimist. 
and I'm encouraging us to be Afro-optimists. And when you are an Afro-optimist, you are in good company. When you are Afro-optimist, you are in the company of many good men and women. When you are an Afro-optimist, you are in the company of Kwame Nukuruma because he believed that Africa could realize our potential. When you are an Afro-optimist, you are in the company of Julius Kambara Agenyerere. I remember so very vividly on the sixth day of March, 1997, when Julius Kambara Agenyerere had been invited to speak in Accra, Ghana, and he was speaking on the subject of African unity, he said inter alia, that I come here to confirm that Africa can only grow if she is united. And it pains me when I see that we little countries are putting premium on our Ghanaian-ness, our Nigerian-ness, and our Tanzanian-ness. In the scheme of things, what is Tanzania? In the scheme of things, what is Nigeria? In the scheme of things, what is Ghana? In the scheme of things, what are our little countries? He says that the beauty of Africa is that the rest of the world still treats her as if she were one. And she reminded his audience that if Africans are going to commit any sin, the sin that they must not commit is the sin of giving up hope. I am an Afro-optimist in the nature of Julius Kambara Genere. I'm also an Afro-optimist in the class of the man for whom I am named, Patrice Emery Lumumba, died at age 36 when called upon to write a letter to his wife. He had two wives, two of them, four wives in fact, two of them had the same name, Josephine. So when the letter was released to Josephine, they were jostling, it was it, Josephine number one or Josephine number two, but that does not matter. The letter was written and he said, I know that I'm going to die, but my joy, even when I die, the Congolese and the Africans will now write their history and their story. I'm an optimist in that regard. But I'm also an optimist a lot more with due respect to the economic circumstances of the continent. I'm an optimist who believes, like the young Ghanaian economist writer Dambi Samoy, that Africa will only rise if she does not look at aid as the solution to our problem. I'm only an optimist in the class of Dambisa when she warns us that China and India and the West have appetite for our resources, but we cannot blame them. We must blame ourselves because in the nature of things, we must trade with China, we must trade with Europe, we must trade with America, but we can only trade from a position of strength. I am an optimist like my own fellow countryman, Professor Kalestas Juma, who in his book, The New Harvest, says, we can only feed ourselves if we begin to embrace innovation and invention. I am an optimist who believes that Africa can rise, Africa will rise, and Africa can rise, and I'm an optimist who believes that those of you who are present here are the ones who, in the nature of things, must now embrace what I call the Holy Spirit of economic development. This, in a manner of speaking, is the day of the Pentecost. <laughs> and I'm now saying, let the Spirit fall upon us. Let the Spirit invade our hearts and minds. I started at the beginning by saying that I was preceded in these lectures by a great man. I was preceded by Ben Wabueze. And when he spoke, he spoke about constitutionalism. Let constitutionalism have meaning when we talk about governance. And I think that it will have meaning. I was preceded in this particular regard by Ali Mazrui when he talked about democracy. Let democracy be defined by us. I was preceded by John A. Laigu. I was preceded by Professor Utom, and I was preceded by Kingsley Mohalu. I was preceded by great men, and I am in the presence of great men who believe that we can solve our problems of governance 
We can solve our problems of insecurity. We can solve our problems of poverty. We can solve our problems of economic underdevelopment. And we can only do so if we embrace the things that change nations. Let us today do so. God bless you. Please be seated. I can now see we are all the disciples of the Afro-optimism. Please be seated. And while you're sitting down, can you keep clapping? <laughs> he spoke for exactly an hour. And you can see the discipline in the delivery. We will ask questions uh, for brevity and for time. We will take uh, two questions or three for, from Afro optimists <laughs> and the disciples of today's. Uh, conversion lecture. I can see Kingsley Moralu here. Uh, a couple of the people we mentioned, Pado Tommy, like I said, is gone over to Nairobi for to sign a real contract. Um, questions okay. my uh, request uh, my request, uh, a friend of mine who led the gateway, the, the frontier to South Africa in the early days of the apartheid regime going away, uh, Chief Sonny Iroche. Yeah, I believe you can ask a short question. I've watched virtually all your videos. You speak so well. You are convinced. Question is, would you consider practicalizing what you preach by running for the presidency of Kenya? One, no, seriously, look, we must be doers of the world and not just hearers and speakers of the world. Africa's failure is leadership. And you've demonstrated clearly, eruditely, that you are imminently qualified from what you say to deliver for Kenya. Secondly, Professor Joy, who you might not remember, were the delegation that went to. And the Ethiopian government told us clearly that you cannot invest in Ethiopia if you are not an Ethiopian. You cannot buy land. And I was thoroughly disappointed. The other question I wanted to ask you, which you've answered, was your take on Nigeria shutting her, her, her borders to her African neighbors. Thank you. Let me answer the question about Ethiopia. And I left this out so that we could engage in it. Right now, there are a number of things that are happening in Africa that are very interesting. Ethiopia was under the Deg regime of Mengistu Hail Mariam for almost 10 years. And the Deg regime replaced what was a feudal government under Hail Selassie. Then there was the civil war and the guerrilla movement under Meles Zenawi in 1984. I was a university student then. And I remember that at that particular time in the life of Ethiopia, in terms of electricity generation, they generated no more than 500 megawatts of electricity. In the last over 20 years, Ethiopia 
by next year will be generating anything between 10,000 and 15,000 megawatts. That is still more than Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, Burundi, South Sudan combined. And the reason, and of course Nigeria, <laughs> and, 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 and the reason is the Ethiopians took the view is that in order to grow your market, you've got to protect certain aspects of your market. And I think that was the underlying philosophy. I believe that you have read, and if you have not, you'll read the book written by the South Korean Hai Jun Chang, The Bad Samaritans. In the book, some, The Bad Samaritan, Hai Jun Chang says that the Europeans have been prescribing to the world models of development that they themselves did not use. He says, that if you look at the history of any one of the European powers, whether it's the United Kingdom, whether it's Germany, whether it's France, whether it's the United States of America, and subsequently even the Asians like Japan and even now China and South Korea, they protected their markets. There are certain areas where they did not allow people to invest. And another thing that they did was to subsidize certain critical areas including in the area of research and development. And the Ethiopians took that view in those early days. As I speak to you now, the Ethiopians are beginning to open their markets for mobile telephony. They are opening their markets for banking. They are opening their markets for insurance because they now think they are ready. And I think that that, even when we talk about African trade, there will be wisdom in doing that. And I can understand, if you ask me in a room, with, I understand why the Nigerians are closing their market with Benin. There are economic reasons. I understand why they are closing their market with Ghana. But my only contra-argument that Nigeria is so big that even if you allowed Benin and Ghana, nothing would happen. It would be uh, like watering the desert with a teaspoon. That is how big Nigeria is. So effectively what one is saying is that even when we talk about Africa moving and freeing the markets, there are certain fundamentals that must be addressed. Which brings me to a question that you did not ask, but I'll answer ne nevertheless. You, 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 uh, well, ECOWAS is now talking about the eco. I'm sneezing, and if you are about to sneeze, you must sneeze. <coughs> it's one of the things that you must do when it comes. So you can see, for example, the ECOA says they must have the ECO by next year. I don't think you'll have the ECO next year. And if you ask the economists, and I'm not one, they will tell you, no. There are certain fundamentals that must be in place. But it's a good idea. So in short, sharp answer is Africa will have to open up slowly, and the individual countries, because of their different traditions, will have to open up slowly. Which brings me to the question. Is it the case that anybody who wants to change their country must be president? I don't believe so. I do not believe so. In fact, I hold the view that sometimes you are a lot more effective outside of the trappings of the presidency. Because if it, if it happens, it's a good thing. Because the truth be told, it is easier to influence things from the top if you are well-intentioned. Which brings me to Rwanda, for example. If you listen to somebody like Paul Kagame, there is clarity, whether you say many things about him, about human rights and other things. But look at a country whose obituary had been written in 1994. Of course, it is still a small country, a population of 12 million, a GDP of no more than 12 billion United States dollars. But you look at what has happened in the recent past against the history that we are talking about, you can see clarity. And that is the clarity that I think sometimes we miss in many African countries. The fact that if we want to deal with the health sector, we are improving the health sector in a manner that is choreographed, in a manner that is, in, is coherent. If we are dealing with agriculture, it is coherent. If we are dealing with the mining sector, it is coherent. If we are dealing with research and development for purposes of invention and innovation, it is, in, is, is, is coherent. If you go to Rwanda today, you can go to Rwanda in the morning and you apply for registration of a company in the morning, in the afternoon you'll have a certificate of registration. That is what you need. The, the environment is enabling. 
But in some countries, you, go, you must know a minister in order to incorporate a company. You must know a senior government official in order to run business. That is bad for business. So I hold the view and I hear you. But one of the most critical things is that each one of us must now play their roles wherever they are. Because if you wait to be president, the African electorate is also very interesting. The African electorate will listen to all your good ideas. But on the day of the voting, what motivates them is totally different. So it is, it is much more likely, and, and, and I, I, uh, I, uh, if you look at, there is the story of Alibaba and the 40 thieves. Africans are much more likely to put Alibaba and the 40 thieves in office than put good men and women in office. And, and that is why sometimes I think we are co-authors of our own misfortune. Let us ask ourselves today, and I'm giving a good example. Today, if you are to ask Nigeria, Nigerians, <coughs> I don't know much, but perhaps Aliko Dangote, through his entrepreneurship, and his other colleagues in the business world contribute monumentally to the Nigerian country in terms of taxes and other things. And if you go to South Africa, you'll discover that that is the case. You may have your own Nigerian concerns about how they conduct business. But the truth is, if you have salt in your, in, in your house, there is an entrepreneur that is doing it. And it rather a Likodango did us it in Nigeria, so rather some, some, some British did it. So I'm saying wherever you are, whatever you do, make a contribution. If you wait to be the president, you'd be waiting for Godot. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take, uh, yeah, we'll take three questions so you can answer. Is it concurrently they say in English? Uh, so, you know, if you look on this side of the hall, there are all women on the high table. So it's if we extend that level of influence as well. Uh, Dr. Mrs. Mwakwe, she asked your question. Dr. Mogalo, then uh, Chief Mrs. Okoli. So we can just... Uh... Oh, I, I know your name. Sorry, okay. If, sorry, Prof first, the next Prof question from the front row. After that, we'll that go That was a the... very, very thought-provoking... But as I sat down I was thinking... How can we get to the root of the problems in Africa and the problems in Nigeria and other West African countries? You said it. Africa. I'm saying Africa is not at peace because African people are not at peace. Africa is poor because African people are spiritually, mentally, and emotionally poor. So right in this room, we have an African optimist. In the of Mrs. Ijejidema, who has been doing this lecture for the past 12 years since after the death of her husband. So I'd like for us to please give her a big hand of applause. Now, the of a for a People. So I'd like to ask you, what do you think is the deal with the issues in the continent through developing people spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and physically? Very much. Um, Professor Lumumba. I'd like to, first of all, thank you uh, for an excellent lecture. My name is Kingsley Morgalu. And first, I want to begin by saying that I am not waiting for Godot. And I want to say, I want to tell you why. The Nigerian case is very unique. We have brilliant people in this country in any sphere of endeavor, whether it is business, whether it is academia, whether it is science, whether it is engineering, we have them. And yet, we are where we are. The question is, 
why. Therefore, I say to you, Professor Lumumba, that we can do all we want in our different spheres. We can succeed in our little boxes, but we succeed not because we have good governance, because we don't, but we succeed in spite of the weak governance that we have. Therefore, for this country, and that's why I left my own comfort zone, I was never a politician. I never planned to be one. But I was a professor in the United States at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. And one day I was teaching my class and I'm looking at these brilliant young men and women. And I say to myself, in 10 years I'm 15, the director of the CIA is probably here. Secretary of State is here. Some big industrialist is here. Why am I developing somebody else's country? And I said, I will return to my own country and I will contest for the highest office of the land. So we know the difficulties. We know the difficulties. And that difficulty begins with the people themselves. You can say, a lot of brilliant, good people here. But when the Professor Lumumbas and outside in the polling booths, the Professor Lumumbas of this world come out to contest, you've said it in another lecture, <laughs> they will not vote for you. They will vote not for their solution. They will vote for their problem. So the problem, the, the issue in this country as I know it, it the root of it, is with the psyche of the people. It has been shattered, it has been battered, the people have been made to feel subhuman, and they accept those who are their overlords and worship them. So you come with a good mind and good solutions. You're very brilliant, but you're blowing grammar, as they say. So the point I'm trying to make is that in this country, for one, we will not solve our developmental challenges except we address the leadership problem. It's not good enough that you can affect your society in different ways. Dangote has not changed the Nigerian economy. Dangote's economy is doing well. And so many other people. But the economy of Nigeria, the GDP per capita, the poverty rate, will never change except you have a leadership with an economic mind and capacity and a mindset of transformation. It is our business as the people of Nigeria to re reorient ourselves, to understand that this is our priority and that we must make it happen. Thank you. Yeah, we, 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 to the great gentleman there. My name is George. Thank you. My name is Ken Okechuku. Um, our colonizers, I don't like to use former because they are still here. <laughs> yes, they only left temporarily under what we call um, malicious compliance. Okay. Want to rule yourself? Okay. Malicious compliance. Professor Lumumba, you are aware of this document that uh, French, uh, French, fr well, Francophone Africans, African countries, signed with the French government. Continuation of colonization signed in 1958 and being operated as we speak and listen. Where they return their treasury, their various treasuries to the French um, treasurer in France. And from there, they borrow at interest. How? Oh, <laughs> okay. Then, are you aware also that the AU Secretariat in Addis Ababa was built, designed and built and donated to Africa by the Chinese government? 
where all the walls and ceilings have ears and mouth, and at every uh, conference or deliberation, you are being monitored live at Beijing. That is why no African leader can stand up there to say, uh, I mean, to say things that uh, offend China. So, if all these are there, how do you think that separate African countries will begin to make moves when the colonial incubus is on them? Consider the effect of this on 14 francophone African countries who are under a document continuation of colonization. And so, and you said it also, that in each of these countries, a detachment of the French army is there. And they can invade you without notice once they feel that their interest is under threat by your government. Thank you. I've seen your hand, so I think perhaps she has had a, had a hand up for a long time. I just want to uh, have a little adjunct to what this, uh, my, uh, the, the, lady, the man that followed me uh, spoke on. So right now we have this wonderful agreement called the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. And under this agreement we have different protocols from movement of people and goods. But for whatever reason, I don't know why the fourth industrial revolution is not considered under this agreement. Three things. Firstly, there's a great firewall of China, which I'm sure he kind of um, sort of alluded to through, through um, the kind of neocolonization of Africa. And then he also, we also, right now we also know that other countries like DRC, Uganda, Kenya even, have various policies that are trying to replicate this firewall. And the implications are largely that, firstly, China will have a stranglehold on anything digital in Africa. Secondly, that war or that, those uh, artificial boundaries that you have tried to um, educate us on and how we're going to try and avoid with redrawing them have, through technology and the digitalization, have been created for us. How do you see a way out of this, sir? That's my question to you. Thank you. Let, let's say... My, my answers are really not answers in that uh, strict sense. But, th but they are the result of my agonizing over these issues, because you cannot pretend to have answers. And, and let me look at the last question that you've asked about the Fourth Industrial Revolution and the SCTF. And I start by what I experienced in 1998. You remember in 1998, there was meant to be a high-level WTO meeting in Washington in the United States of America. And I found myself at a meeting in Grand Bassam in Cote d'Ivoire, convened by the office of the French Prime Minister to prepare former French colonies on their position at that high-level meeting. I was also aware that the OAU at that time had also convened a meeting to take a continental position. And I was a young graduate trying to get interest in the WTO. What amazed me is that the French were so careful as to prepare their former colonies on matters as mundane as sub subsidies on agricultural products. I remember in Kenya, the then cabinet minister whom I knew was going to lead the delegation of three other people, none of whom knew anything about the WTO. If you looked at the equivalent delegation of countries such as Japan or the United States, there are delegations of up to 300 people on all critical issues. So you are going there, half of your delegation has no idea what you are going to talk about, and I dare say that part of the SCTF 
as I see it, will require great technical input. And, and the good professor has said something that is very key. If you look at Nigeria, you tell me, in what area don't you find a Nigeria? In fact, a friend of mine said, half in jest, half in seriousness, if you go to anywhere in the world and you don't find a Nigerian, leave. It tells you that there is nothing happening there. That is how adventurous the spirit of the Nigerian is. And now that the Secretariat has been established in Accra, one of the things that I would love to see is that at Lagos University School of Business, something is beginning to happen to inform at an intellectual level what is going to be dealt with in the area of free movement of goods and services. I would want to see governments uh, involving themselves in research and development. I would want to see now that we have regional CDCs. We used to have a CDC, Center for Disease Control in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, which is funded from outside, which means you are underfunded. We have now, I think we now have one in Southern Africa, one in Congo, one in West Africa, and one in the Eastern part of Africa. And when we go into those areas, and I speak about those because they are very critical. Right now, for example, we are going through a trial run of a vaccine for Ebola. Who knows what people, I'm not, this is con, not conspiracy theory, but who knows? We are merely guinea pigs in that arena. And we are guinea pigs in very many areas. So my message is, and this is where anchor countries are very critical. Nigeria is an anchor country in this region. Is it sufficiently internally organized to be the lone voice that will provide leadership in this regard as it is presently constituted, I doubt. I doubt that it's playing its role. But whenever it has played its role, it has put this uh, region in order. When it played its role in Liberia during the Okomog, it uh, stabilized the region. When it put its voice down during the debacle in the Gambia, but it is not only and should not only be in post-election violence situation. It should provide leadership in the arts and in the sciences. And it's not going to be easy. But it must be done if we are going to give meaning to SCTF. And my own view is that SCTF is actually a rehash of the Lagos Plan of Action. If you look at the Lagos Plan of Action and SCTF, there is nothing that is fundamentally different. But we will only take advantage of those things if we are properly organized, which brings me to the question that you posed. Will the colonizers, as you choose to uh, call them, allow us to be at ease? If you look at many African countries in the area of research and development, even here in Nigeria, you go to any university, you go to universities in different parts of Africa, who is funding research and development? If it is in the area of technology, who is funding it? If it is in the area of pharmaceuticals, who is funding it? If it is in the area of oil and gas, who is funding it? If it is in the area of uh, uh, intellectual property, who is funding it? It is true that all this funding is coming from outside. And he or she who pays the piper calls the tune. And, and, and I don't blame those who are paying the pipers. They must call the tune. China now knows that this is the last frontier in terms of resources. It has sharp appetite for resources. And it is doing what is in the best interest of China. And I don't fault them. It is the duty of the Chinese to do what is in the best interest of China. It is the duty of Nigeria to do what is in the best interest of Nigerians, and by extension for Africans to do what is in the best intention of Africans. And if they don't do, you will be consumed. Because the truth is the world is still a jungle where throats are literally cut. And until the day that we recognize that, we are not going to go anywhere. And I agree with you. You know, give, allow me this analogy. There are certain things that you must never allow anybody to do for you. When you are establishing your home, your home, your house should never be built by anybody. Because that is your source of pride. The headquarters of the United 
of, of, of the African Union should have been built by African. There are enough Africans, even if you are to go through the business community, you name flaws after them and massage their ego, they would build that thing. But we lost that. It is spilt milk. We now have the building. We will not bring it down. I don't think it is wise to bring it down. If you go to that building, the Germans have also built another one next to it. Which means that Africa is still answering to the tunes of this. And fortune favors the vigilant. Are we vigilant? No. A Congolese performed a pioneering operation, but is being done at a hostel in Brussels, not in Mama Yemo Hostel in Kinshasa. So all these good men and women, whether it is doctors, whether it is engineers in cutting edge technology, they are excelling out there. Because if they came to any African country, they would be paid possibly the equivalent of $500 per month. They wouldn't even be able to ride an Okada. This is the problem, which brings me to the question which uh, I can't disagree with you at all. I remember in the year 2007, I, I attended a, a conference which was, uh, uh, it was a meeting, and I think it was the Armed Forces uh, Training Center in Kenya, and I told my audience that I hold the view that the shortest route to changing your country, a view which I still hold, is from the top. No doubt, but I want to give you a very painful or very painful examples in the recent past in Africa. The leaders whose exploits we have been celebrating in the recent past have never emerged from the ballot. Yoweri Museveni, who performed very well in the first 10 years, tried to contest as the head of a political party called Fronasa. He was never voted in. It is when he mounted the guerrilla movement and seized power in Uganda. Whether you think he has overstayed or not is another debate, but he succeeded through his NRM, NRA to stabilize Uganda. It is only when he had seized power by force that the electorate was able to say, so he could perform. Mele Zenawi seized power after guerrilla movement and started the opening of Ethiopia. If he had contested an election, I doubt whether he would have been elected. Paul Kagame, if Paul Kagame had contested elections in Rwanda, I doubt whether the electorate would have voted him in. Joseph Kabila in the Democratic Republic, Laurent Desire Kabila, and ultimately Joseph the Sun, initially through that route. You know, the logic of the example that I'm giving is very dangerous. <laughs> It's very dangerous, and I, I, I'm almost feel guilty to say. But the reality is, is that it would appear that on average, the African electorate is, cap is incapable through manipulation and a combination of other factors of recognizing the men and women who mean well for her through the electoral process. The net effect, therefore, is that our good men and women will try through the ballot and they will never in the short to medium term gain entry through that avenue. Should they give up? No. They should never give up. 
because I hold the view that the best way of getting into position of power is to have a people's mandate, however defined. It is not for the faint-hearted. People will recognize, and that is why men and women such as yourself also have a duty to write, to immortalize their stories, to tell generations. This is what we abandoned in order to be where we are. We did not achieve the ultimate goal, but this is where we reached. When I contested for a member of parliament seat in the year 2000, I was very young. I was not elected. And immediately I wrote a 90-page book called A Call for Political Hygiene in Kenya. And the reason why I call it a, a call for political hygiene, when I was campaigning, I was amazed. I held 250 town hall meetings, and whenever I was meeting my audience, they agreed with me passionately. They say, you are saying the right things. You are a man. When they held up uh, these things called opinion polls, I was leaving by two digits, leading. On the day of the election, I visited several polling stations. The people that I saw told me, and I talked to many of them, I asked them, do you live here? I said, no, we don't. We have actually been imported. We were registered as voters several months ago. So the people that I was campaigning amongst were not voters in my electoral area. The people who are voting were imported from elsewhere. And these are realities that I believe even here in Nigeria you can relate with. So, so that the rigging does not start now. The rigging starts when they start registering people who are 13 years old as if they were 18. And the rigging starts by importing voters. And as Lenin said in Russia, when the chips are down, it is not those who vote, but those who count the votes that matter. And, and I think that that is what happens many times. But I think that Africans are now beginning to be a little more vigilant, and they are beginning to be angry, so I cannot give up on the ballot. And those who can in that arena must try. Those who can in other arenas, but I can't agree with you more. The shortest avenue to changing society fundamentally is politics. There is a great Indian whom I must share his thoughts with. He is called Two Indians. One is the 1912 Nobel laureate Rabin Narath Tagore. And the other one is C.J. Gala Golapachari, who was the minister in the first Indian government. Both of them, after different circles, says, when politics stumbles, the country pays. And unless you introduce hygiene in your politics, your country can be great in many things, but its greatness will always be limited. The last question, Africa is not at peace. Two months ago, I watched an interview which was conducted amongst 2,000 young men and women who had crossed the Mediterranean, and they were being interviewed from Lampedusa in Italy. One of them said, and he was speaking for the rest, this is, he was asked, if you are to go back to Africa, would you make the same journey? He said, yes. And I asked myself, what is it that could drive a person from his or her home that even when he has gone through the valley of the shadow of death, when he is asked, he said, I would repeat it again, what is at home? What is so bad at home? And one of the things that most amazes me is despite all these things, you and me know that there is modern day slavery in Libya. There is slavery. Africans are being subjected to slavery, classical slavery, as we knew it in Libya. I've never heard of an emergency meeting of the AU an emergency meeting of ECOWAS, an emergency meeting of East African community to discuss the plight of African immigrants. I've heard of an emergency meeting of the European Union to stop Africans from getting into Europe. Africans are not at peace. Is it a spiritual question? For those who are spiritually inclined, they may think so. 
Is it an emotional I issue for those who think that that is an area of intervention? They may think so. But I hold the view that the reason why we find ourselves in that situation is because the men and women whom we have successively entrusted with leadership have abused that leadership so very thoroughly that they have poisoned the environment, dehumanized their people so thoroughly that their people long lost hope. And that in order to restore that, what you need to do is to sanitize your politics, create an environment where people have hope, and believe me you, no place is better than home. Why do I think that that is the case? I think that that is the case because post-genocide Rwanda is an example. If for 100 days there was nothing in Rwanda, people died. Genocide in the 20th century, we saw it. The obituary of Rwanda had been written. Why is it that almost 90% of the Rwandese want to go back home? How is it that in Rwanda today, they are closing private schools because public schools are performing so well and they are giving the same quality of education. Once again, Paul Kagame has no shortage of enemies outside Rwanda, including Rwandese, but on a scale of one to 10, given the history of Rwanda, he has succeeded in demonstrating that when you use the resources of the country well and you deploy them in a manner that is people-centric, then people respond. And I have no doubt that it can be done. And it can be done here in Nigeria. It can be done in Ghana. It can be done in many countries. And I conclude with this example. Botswana. Botswana recently had an election. And it's one of the few countries where the election loser takes the phone and calls the winner and said, brother, it was a good race. The people have spoken. Let us work together. And what is the reason? It's because they have a tradition and a culture and institutions which can withstand the vagaries of politics. Botswana was a backwater country whose claim to fame is that they had more cows than human beings. They came to Kenya in the 1970s. Today they have a leather industry that Kenya can only look in all art. They discovered diamond, they invited the beers, but they did it in a manner that meant that the quality of the lives of the people of Botswana would be improved. It is one of the only countries in the continent of Africa which has ever had a budget supplies, in excluding Mauritius. Once again, it is the quality of politics. So I think, as I conclude, and I'm spiritual, without being religious. But I'm very, I warn myself, because when we use spirituality in the loose sense that we now have it used in Africa, then it makes Africans believe that there are things that can only be obtained by prayer and fasting. No. God, in his divine wisdom, closed the shop that makes manna. That is my own dramatic way of explaining it. He gave us the intellectual wherewithal to make our own manner. And therefore, we have come here. The divine instruction has always been clear. Go ye and subdue the world. It is our duty to subdue the world. And I think that in this assembly, there is no shortage of men and women of great exposure. You tell me. In the men and women in this assembly, whom have you not dined with? Kings and kings. At which seats of learning have you not been to? We can do it. There is nothing that is different. When Her Excellency Professor was the ambassador, in terms of intellect, what is the difference between her and the representative of the United States of America? The only difference is that the country that accredited that ambassador is a $15 trillion economy. And therefore, when she speaks... We listen. Suppose that Nigeria had a two trillion dollar economy and she spoke, we would not be campaigning to join the permanent membership of the UN Security Council. You would be invited. Thank you.
Thank you. We have five more minutes, so we can end up. May I now please uh, direct you to the platform that is here with us. Uh, we don't run this whole program on charity. Over the last 10 years, we've been you know, funding it, and uh, through the help of people like you who are here present today. So if you can fill up the uh, platforms and return them to me, uh, I'll be quite glad. But having said that, I would like to call on one of our major sponsors, our Platinum uh, sponsors, just to say a few words of encouragement. She runs one of the most, uh, one of the multinationals in Africa uh, in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, in the last couple of years, she's given us tremendous support. I think she's here with a charming daughter. I don't know who wants to speak first. Uh, Okay, I hear the daughter wants to take the podium. Please a round of applause for her. Good afternoon, distinguished guests, and as the hour is late, I will stand on existing protocols. When I heard the daughter wants to take the podium, I think mandated to might be a more accurate description. I should say that it would be a tough act to follow, except I'm not trying to follow in your footsteps. I'm going to stay in my own lane. But even if I decided to follow, sir, you have laid such a foundation of wisdom that surely you would hold up under me. Thank you for that, sir. It falls to me to make an introduction or reintroduction to the EMSOR group. Um, Dr. Jidema was kind enough to give us the opportunity to take um, the lead sponsorship position here, and it certainly has not been wasted. We've heard today of African names which are contrived to give us a different um, leaning of origin. Well, EMSOR, I'm very happy to say, is a composite of two beautiful Igbo names. Emeka, doing exceedingly well, and Uzama, the good way. My name is Uzama Ezoke. Emzo is a family business, and I must take a moment to call out our visioner. And um, she's not a stranger to many of you, but she's my madame. You know, but she says that we are all men in Emzor, so perhaps I should say she is my Oga at the top. <laughs> Dr. EJ asked us to call out our heroes. She really is my hero. I won't say she's fearless, because we've learned that courage is a more important quality than fearlessness. She's both the vivid visioner, but she's also our courageous leader. In describing her, perhaps I will talk about how she makes us feel at Emzor. She's not someone that you want to say no to or I can't. Hopefully that is not born of fear, but more of a desire to honor the investments she continues to make in ensuring all of our success personally and as an organization. Basically, Emzo is Nigeria's largest pharmaceutical company, but I will also stress largest manufacturer I make the distinction because the majority of the companies in this country in the pharmaceutical sector are involved in importation and marketing of goods. And we've heard today how important it is that we must produce what we consume. So I am taking back to our team an increased focus on the impetus we have to continue to manufacture at a level of quality and to expand the scope of what we manufacture. The pride I have in Emzor does not stem from our growing revenues or widening portfolio of products. It's more in the impact and, um, that we have on healthcare outcomes within the country. I'll just use one statistic. Nigeria and India account for one third, one in every three children under the age of five who dies. Well, actually, that is the 2018 statistic. That's our current level. We contribute in such a negative way to healthcare outcomes for young children. 
The leading causes are things like diarrhea, pneumonia, malaria, and nutritional deficiencies. I'm proud to say that MZOP manufactures in every single one of those categories, including WHO recommended um, therapies. We heard mention of Novartis and Bayer, and there will be other, there will be the Pfizer's and all the names that many of the people as I look around the room probably insist on when they go to the pharmacy to fill their prescriptions. They have their place because they've done their work. It is also our time as an industry here to, in, to insist that we build the quality standards that allow you to go and make a demand for products that are manufactured in Nigeria. It said that our dignity can only be regained if we regain our independence. Well, we have under her leadership a mandate to break the dependence we have as a nation on imported products within our sector. To that end, we began production at the end of 2018 in our new, how would I call it? I wouldn't say a factory. It transcends a factory. It really is a manufacturing campus. It sits on 60 hectares and we haven't even scratched the surface of using up the resources there within. It was a drive and a push because the three other factories that we have prior to beginning this only had a limited capacity with regard to the scope of products that could be manufactured. And we really, with, a, with the African Continental Free Trade Agreement coming, we've had a different view because they have not determined sovereignty. So we have Chinese companies setting up multi-million dollar factories in places like Mali. You would ask, of all the countries, why would you come to Mali? And then it would dawn on you that you have not come to Mali. You have come to the light of our glory and our numbers. Because with those borders opening and no declaration of sovereignty over who is determined an African manufacturer, we are the target. So we cannot whine about it. We cannot whinge about it. We must compete to the best of our ability. In the midst of power cuts, in the midst of importing what our Chinese and Indian competitors walk across the street to pick up. But I was so excited to receive a shipment of cassava, which a Nigerian company had developed and worked to a pharmaceutical grade. I'm so hopeful that it works. I shared it with um, a European colleague, and they said, ah, oh, but cassava is full of cyanide. I said, if villagers have figured out a way to wash it in the river, an industry can figure out a way to make it fit for use. So I won't keep you um, much longer, except to share about another um, aspect of the EMSO group. We have Zolon Healthcare. Zolon currently has about 50 products, none of which until this December have been manufactured in Nigeria. It was a strategy to allow us to play in markets that we didn't have the capacity to manufacture for, but we have a clear roadmap that would allow us to constantly move products over from that portfolio onto the manufacturing side. And the last part of our group I will tell you about is Emzo Pesco. Actually, before I do that, does anybody know Emzo's leading product? By show of hands. Ah, we must follow instructions, dear Africans, by show of hands. Okay, I'll ask the lady in green, what is that product? It's a pain reliever, I will take the name, madam. Is it just paracetamol? It is Emza paracetamol. So Maris, please make sure she gets her gift bag. And then I'm going to dare one more thing to see whether we have indeed had an imprint in the country. Would anyone dare to, in or out of key, sing the jingle for that brand, the 20 year old jingle? Oh, I, so, okay, who's going to go for it? Stand and sing. Yes, sir. You feel better. And you know, that's amazing because you probably were not more than eight years old when that was playing. So thank you for that, sir. The last division is EMSOR HESCO. HESCO being an acronym for hospital equipment and medical consumables. This is possibly the part of the group about which I am the most excited when it comes to impact and outcome. We don't manufacture any medical equipment. HESCO has um, imaging, so we have ultrasounds, we have endoscopy machines, we have autoclaves, and some fairly high-tech items which we have not yet developed the capacity to produce in Nigeria. We also have an array of consumables. Um, products for doctors. But what excites me about this group 
is the opportunity that we have through selective partnership to impact certain aspects of healthcare. We partner with companies who make a commitment to train our doctors and to train our nurses, whether it is having them go abroad, such as for our orthopedics unit. We had partnered with the world's largest manufacturer of orthopedics, and to date, over 100 surgeons have gone for training, specific training, and it's a repeating course. Why? Why is this so exciting and so important? I had it that if, well, most this is a fairly young room, but I would ask Dr. EJ that we must make the room even younger. It's not often these days that I walk into a room and feel young, but I felt quite young walking in here. I've seen some of your lectures, sir, and even to, you know, students at the entry level of secondary school in attendance. I think we need to inculcate a right thinking and right background and right history. So if we could make an effort within this forum to have a measure of um, younger folk in the room. But the beauty of it is if someone had to have a knee replacement or a hip replacement, the statistics show that India is a destination of choice for Nigerians for such um, procedures. Now, to go to India to have a joint replaced, you will of course have to take a caregiver because your, your mobility will be limited. You may or may not have the scope to really do a good due diligence on the hospital in the way that you would if it was in your home country. So in addition to the cost, you are denied one of the major aspects, especially for the elderly, of making a good recovery, and that is the support of community. I mean, what is the point of being unwell if you cannot have troops of people coming into your home with open salad, fish pepper soup, goat meat pepper soup, plenty, plenty pepper? I mean, that is the cocoa of being unwell, is the, what you receive from the community as you recover. Imagine the loneliness of having to do this in a different country where your language may or may not be spoken to the level of your understanding. So it is with great, great pride that we can say we're a part of stemming the tide of medical tourism and also by equipping the facilities better, stemming the tide of the brain drain. It is difficult to keep a sharp mind here if their mind is not tested, if the equipment is not working. So we also have a team of biomedical engineers that is focused on restoring existing equipment, not just selling. Well, I've said all of that to say that Dr. Pasitomi threw out a, a um, charge. He said, make a commitment and do something. So in a few minutes, I've tried to share some of what the MZO group is doing in our beloved country. We are also in Sierra Leone and Liberia and undergoing registrations for five other African countries. It is not only they who can come in, we too must go out. So in being invited to be a diamond partner, it occurred to me that like a diamond, what my mother has built in the MZO group is something forged under pressure. It certainly has not been easy. And over time, it hasn't come overnight. And we don't even believe that we have fully emerged but it is our desire through dedication, focus, and commitment to emerge brilliant and strong, an asset of enduring value for our nation. Thank you for the opportunity. Please give a round of applause. Thank you for your sponsorship. Like I did mention, she's one of the major multinationals who have in this country, the pharmaceutical sector. I didn't get an embrace. Uh, by uh, this juncture, uh, we are just on the final note. Uh, like it's again another reminder of the pledge forms, and we would like your support as high as what uh, EMSA has given us in the last couple of years. Uh, before the vote of thanks, uh, I would also like us to present some plaque of appreciation, some embodiment of appreciation to two distinguished people here. Uh, one of them, of course, is Prof. Joy Ugo, the first female chairperson of this event over the last couple of years. A distinguished diplomat, uh, and somebody you remember with good memory. I'll now request uh, the plaques are available. Yes. I'll now request uh, Chief Mrs. Akonde and the industrialists in their own right. Uh, to please present the plaque to Her Excellency Ambassador Professor Joy Ogo. Plaque, please. 
Yes. Professor George. 